Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you, and welcome to Muslim Mindset, a podcast dedicated to bringing you research, science, and human experiences with a Muslim perspective to inspire you to live purposefully, productively, and prioritize your mental health and well being. My name is Aisha Aziz. Welcome to today's episode of Muslim Mindset. I'm so excited to introduce our guest today, Dr. Mona Al Idrisi. Dr. Mona has a PhD in sociology and has also studied Quranic, Arabic, Fiqh, and Islamic studies. She has years of experience dealing with narcissism in the Muslim community and recently published her book, The Muslim Narcissist. We are honored to have her with us today to share her insight and expertise. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Mona. Thank you so much. I want to start by asking you what inspired you to explore psychology and personality disorders from a Muslim perspective. So I actually started my studies within the theological field at university. I was very interested as to why there were so many um, reverts to Islam who later on in their reversion journeys decided to leave Islam. And while I was studying the subject, I found that the problem was lots of reverts coming into contact with problematic Muslims, Muslims who were at the time, not, you know, narcissistic. I didn't know what narcissists were at the time. So I was still studying it because I was working in the Islamic Cultural Center before I started my studies. And we used to get so many, you know, uh, Western reverts and converts. They used to come to our office and say, we don't want to be Muslims anymore. So I decided to study what the reason was behind that. So when I um, actually got into, you know, studying this, I was actually experiencing narcissistic abuse during my marriage. I was actually just learning about narcissism at the time. As I listened to people's stories and I thought, okay, this sounds like narcissistic abuse. It sounds like spiritual abuse, religious abuse. It's the same thing that I'm experiencing. So why don't I just dive really deep into the subject? So I can help all these reverts who want to leave Islam because of dealing with problematic narcissistic Muslims. And that's where it came from. So that's where I blended my studies of psychology with, you know, Islam because I went to Saudi. I studied Islamic studies and fiqh in Omar Qura University. So I combined all three, the fiqh element of psychology, combined the psychology, Western psychology, as well as, you know, my PhD studies of, in sociology to come up with the book that I published last year. Thank you for sharing that with us. In recent years, I feel like there's been a growing discussion around narcissism, and it's a lot more understood recently. And I've also seen more counseling options available now than before. So what made you decide to explore narcissism from an Islamic perspective? Did you feel like there was still a gap, even despite there being so many other resources available? At the time when I when I was going through the, the spiritual abuse myself, I didn't know where to go. I didn't know where to get help from. And there weren't any Muslim counselors who had the, you know, the true Islamic perspective on where narcissism comes from. You know, why do we attract these people? Why do these people, you know, how do people get this disorder? Um, it was just very vague counseling where people would just listen to you, but not actually offer you any solutions or help. So I decided that this was really needed in the community where there's so much help out there in the secular world um, for people who want to learn about narcissistic abuse. But people really need it from an Islamic perspective, because when you're being abused by, you know, misinterpreted Islamic texts and, you know, Arab or Asian culture, Muslim culture, it's very difficult for someone from a secular background or a Western background to fully understand what that spiritual and religious abuse is. So I had to, I felt like I really needed to offer that Islamic perspective on how to deal with narcissistic abuse and where it comes from. Thank you for sharing that. What are the similarities and differences between the Muslim and the Western perspective on narcissism? So in Islam, uh, there are no terms for disorders, for personality disorders. Anything that, you know, goes against the fiqhah of the human being, which is, you know, to be good, to be connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have a soul for that reason. You know, our nafs is, you know, given to us to help us. You know, it's like a compass in this life and our bodies are there to serve us. It's there to serve our soul. It's there to serve our body. And 
you know, if we don't, if we, if we derive from that, if we really take a different path to what was, you know, um, meant for us, then we go against our fitrah. Now, if you go against your fitrah, you start acting in a way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not create you to be. So that's where you become narcissistic. That's why we have the story of a shaitan, you know, in, in the Quran, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to know that such a character and such, such, such traits are not favored in Islam. And that's why he was called a shaitan. A shaitan is, like the word shaitan in Arabic means the rebellious, the one who rebels against the good, okay? So in, in Western psychology, because they cannot, they don't have the religious understanding of, you know, evil spirits and good spirits and the soul and the nafs and all of these things, they have to break down people's behavior symptoms into disorders. So... Like you got psychologists like Sigmund Freud, who, you know, was one of the first people to one of the first uh, secular psychologists to um to say that people who had, you know, these specific traits, narcissistic traits, were considered to be narcissists because they were consistent in that narcissism. Um, codependents were the people who narcissists attracted because they had this collection of symptoms of, of behavior symptoms, and then you had empaths who were also known to you know um have good traits are more charitable, kind-hearted, pure-hearted, and, and all of those things are more spiritual than codependence and narcissists. So um, they were grouped like other people are grouped. Like you have people with Asperger's syndrome, ADHD, uh, people who are bipolar. All of these people are grouped into different categories of disorders in accordance to what the symptoms are. Now, in Islam, all of this is under the umbrella of the disease of the heart. So... So psychologists understand disorders from that perspective by categorizing them. But disease of the disease of the heart, and Hamza Yusuf, Shah Hamza Yusuf does speak a lot about this in his work. Um, it all comes down to a human not behaving in their natural state of fitrah. Like there's there's a neglect for the soul, a neglect for the nerves, a neglect for the you know the physical body and what it's it's meant to do. It's how it's meant to serve us in this life. If we are abusing our soul by disconnecting it from, you know, a relationship with Allah, this is self-abuse. If we are harming our bodies by doing the things that are haram, such as smoking, taking drugs, you know, having um, haram relationships, illegal sexual intercourse, all of these things harm our bodies. If we're doing that to our bodies, we are causing harm to ourselves. The same thing with the nafs as well. Our nafs is there. It's our moral compass. So... The moral compass will help us, it helps to guide us. So Allah gives us our intellect to help our nafs. So for example, if you really feel like doing something, but it's wrong, your intellect will remind you that it's wrong. Your ruh will remind you that it's wrong. They all work together so that we can be healthy human beings. Now, when we neglect the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we harm ourselves by using these different elements in the wrong way, that's when we have you know, disorders. That's when we get narcissism and we get become codependent and we become all of these things. And if they are definitely like, for example, narcissistic people and codependents, they're, you know, the disorder does start from childhood. It is true. It does start from childhood and it starts from the parenting that you receive. But again, you know, it's like a circle that we keep going into because the parents would have been narcissistic or the parents would have been codependent. So it's something that's passed down. It's behavior patterns that are passed down into families. Um, so it's a combination of, you know, um, it's a religious, spiritual problem that we have within ourselves because we don't understand who we are and how we're meant, how our bodies are meant to serve us in this dunya. And it's also, you know, our childhood and how we were raised. What characteristics are typically associated with narcissistic personality disorder? How can someone diagnose a person with narcissism so to diagnose somebody to be not a narcissist or a codependent you have to be consistent in those traits so for example um if you're a doctor if you're a medical doctor you would be identified as a doctor because you practice that every day that's you that's a part of your identity now if you're a lawyer if you're a teacher everyone knows and identifies you as that because that is what you are every day now when you're when you are diagnosed as a narcissist it means that you are practicing your narcissistic traits every single day. Now, all of us have narcissism within us. 
that some people use it for the greater good and some people use it to harm other people. So, for example, everyone has um, the opportunity to be manipulative with other people. We all have the ability to lie. We all have the ability to go into a rage when we're angry. We all have an ability to deceive other people if we're given the opportunity. But it's our moral compass and our faith, you know, that that determines how we use those narcissistic traits within us. So, for example, um, a good way of using um, manipulation or lying would be in a time of war to save themselves. Like sometimes you have to lie for the greater good because you need to save, you know, you need to save victims. You need to save people who are in danger. You need to lie to the enemy. There are ways where you can use the unpleasant traits in a good way. They are people who use their power, who use their authority, who use the fear that other people have of them to instill good. And an example of this in our Islamic history is Umar ibn al-Khattab, who was known to be so tough and so super strict, but it was for the greater good. It wasn't for him to have power. It was to ensure that his society remained steadfast so that because he loved his people, he didn't want them to be accountable for crimes on the day of judgment and what he got out of that was there was no poverty in his lifetime and there were no crimes in his lifetime people were too scared of Umar um, to commit those crimes people can use it in good and people can use it in bad now people who consistently use it in bad the narcissistic traits I do write about it extensively in my in my book but you've got gas gaslighting is when someone constantly makes you doubt your sanity you would have said something to them a couple of weeks before and they tell you they never heard it, you're making it up, you're going crazy and they make you doubt your Islamic knowledge. So, for example, you would go to your husband or your father or, or whoever and say, you know, the Prophet Muhammad said this, you know, he said to be just in this and to be kind in this. And he, he's like, no, who did, who did you get that hadith from? It's not hadith sahih. You know, you need to listen to this sheikh because this sheikh has a better understanding of Islam. And what happens is that people get brainwashed over time with the gaslighting to think, oh, do I really, am I really a good Muslim? Am I really, you know, do I really know much about Islam? Um, like, for example, another thing of spiritual abuse that a narcissist will do would be, why are you praying? You know, you've just committed that sin. You're going to go to hell. You think Allah's going to accept your prayers. I hear this a lot. And this is what spiritual abuse is because it's it's basically taking everything that's good about you and completely destroying it so that you become as worthless as the narcissist feels about him or herself. So all the wonderful things that a narcissist loves about you, they will try their best to take it from you and destroy it in the process. Once you are a destroyed person, once all of those traits, so for example, if you dress really well, if you had a great job, um, if you had great family, you know, family um support or you had great friends around you who were supportive um if that was a great thing about you and you're always happy and jolly the narcissist will make sure that he destroys all of those things in you so that you don't have family around you that you don't have you don't see your friends anymore that now you you don't dress well anymore you don't care about yourself and how you look and because you've given up on life you don't pray anymore because you're so depressed all the time so if like if anyone's experiencing any of this, you know that these people are exercising narcissistic traits on you. This is just like a drop in the ocean of it. You mentioned that, for example, gaslighting is is one trait of a narcissist. Is there any other mm-hmm. very common traits that narcissists would have? Yeah, so they're pathological liars. They lie all the time. Um, a lot of them are not smart liars either because they forget what they lie about. Um, so they give away them, you know, they give themselves away very easily. The more advanced narcissists um, are smarter. They know how to pathologically lie and make you doubt yourself. They know how to get away with it, basically. They're very good at deceiving you. They're very good at putting a, a mask on. You may come across being very religious, you know, very good in the community. For example, a Muslim narcissist. We are living in a world where there are plenty of Muslim narcissists. I mean, this is problematic. When you have a narcissistic personality combined with a Muslim identity, you are now giving the wrong impression of Islam to everybody. You know, people are too scared to convert because of what they hear in the media and all this, you know, terrorism and and everything. So addressing the Muslim narcissist as an identity is extremely important. 
um, because most of the time it's spiritual and religious abuse. You know, when I talk about the Muslim narcissist as a as an identity, um, the main form of abuse will be spiritual and religious. They will use Islam, misinterpreted text, to get away with their narcissism. So, for example, you'll find a husband who cheats on his wife and he uses the excuse that he can have four wives, things like that, that break your iman, that break your love for Islam because of what you're constantly being told about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has permitted men to do. So when you get a woman who is abused by a Muslim husband, if she's not highly educated, if she doesn't understand the true meaning of Islam, she's going to start hating Islam over time. Why did the Prophet Muhammad give men this power? And my husband doesn't provide for me. He's a drug addict. He's abusive to my children. He's not hands-on. He's not present. And I have to obey him? Why? So for this reason, you get a lot of women, more women than men, leave Islam over time. And if they don't leave Islam entirely, um, they will stop practicing Islam. You know, their prayers will become less and less. They will stop wearing hijab. And all of those kinds of things start happening when you are inflicted by narcissistic abuse from a Muslim. Thank you for your insight. Now I'd like to discuss narcissism from a different angle. In your book, you recount a story of a notorious Muslim narcissist who had harmed many people, yet his behavior stemmed from an unresolved childhood trauma. Can you tell us more about how people actually become narcissistic and share his story with us? What eventually happened to him? A lot of narcissism and codependency does stem from childhood because it will depend on the parenting that you've received. So, for example, if you have a narcissistic father and a codependent mother, you will take that example of your parents' relationship and understand that this is what marriage should be like. This is what the husband-wife dynamic looks like. The father shouts at the wife, demands or orders her to do things, and she complies because she's terrified of him, terrified of being verbally abused in front of everybody. So she will comply. This is just an example of one of the things that children could see, you know, while growing up. So you do get some boys, especially if they're close to their fathers, who say, okay, well, that's what I'm going to be like when I'm older. You know, I'm going to be that kind of husband. I'm, I want a wife who's submissive. So as he grows older, this narcissistic little boy will look for someone exactly like his mother. Because that's what he knows. He, this, is, this is the type of woman he knows how to deal with. Because he's had years of training from his father. Now, it doesn't mean that boys will always be narcissistic if, they, if their fathers are narcissistic. If the boys are closer to the codependent mother, there's a higher chance that the boys will be codependent when they're older. So it depends on who the child is closest to and who they admire more as they grow older. Parents who are in denial of their, of their children's bad behaviour and putting the child on the pedestal, not disciplining them for bad behaviour, um, not holding them accountable, teaches them that they can get away with everything in life. So the mother that allows or overspoils a child, um, what she does, she ends up ruining him because he, again, he looks for his mother when he's older. I want a wife who I can wipe the floor with and she doesn't hold me accountable because my own mother never held me accountable. So if my own mother never held me accountable, who are you to hold me accountable? You see what I mean? That's that's the mindset a lot of men grow up with if they've been overspoiled. And it's the same for women as well. Women who are, you know, girls who are overspoiled by their fathers grow up to be very, you know, narcissistic and entitled. And they don't have much respect for their husbands because they've been taught that they can get away with everything. You know, children who are very beautiful, um, they tend to be put on a pedestal more than the other children who are not. So if you've got four children in a household and one of them is stunning one of them is absolutely beautiful and the other three are okay <laughs> they've taken you know they've taken um, other genes <laughs> <laughs> you will find that a mother it could be a codependent mother as well who feels like this is a this is something of value to her this is something i can show off this is something that gives me something to be proud of right look how beautiful my child is i will paste this child all over social media i will you know, I will brag about this child. I will take this child everywhere for people to see how beautiful my child is. And for me, 
to receive that validation that I want because I'm not receiving validation from anything else in my life. So this child, now she holds on to this child, whether it's a narcissistic mother or a codependent mother, and they will use that child for their own self-esteem. Every time they get a compliment, they feel good about themselves. Now, what this child learns is that their value is in their beauty. So they grow older and they have nothing to offer but their beauty because they believe that beauty will take them everywhere in life. And you also get the opposite as well. You know, children who have been abused, sexually abused, abandoned, neglected. And a lot of them can also become uh, narcissistic because they believe that you know, no one cares about them. The world is against them. They hate everybody. So boys growing up... Um, they need more of an emotional attachment with their mothers and girls need more of an emotional attachment with their fathers. So from the age of new, being newborn to seven, uh, girls need, need their mothers. Okay, so that nurturing boys and girls, they both need their mothers. Now from the age of seven, Shara'an in Islam, from the age of seven, if a separation was to happen between two parents, young girls from the age of seven go to their fathers. Now the Islamic perspective on that is because they need their fathers more they need the protection from their fathers and girls need to start understanding how to be treated by men so it's more important that she spends more time with her father from that point on because back in those days girls would get married very young they would get married at 11 12 so you know that kind of training emotional training needed to happen from the age of seven now for boys it was different a boy, because he he there's a chance if he was the only boy, and the woman doesn't have any you know uncles brothers, um, if he, he you know he may end up being her only mahram, her this son. So Islam, uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gave women the opportunity to keep their sons if they wanted to stay with them from the age of seven. So they don't not, they don't automatically go to the father; they stay with the mother because they actually need more emotional nurturing from the mother even until teenage age. They need their mothers more. That's not to say the father doesn't play a role here. He does, because the father's role in the son's life from the age of seven plus is to make sure he grows up to be a man. You know, he, the father teaches him how to be responsible, and he teaches him that by being that role model. Like, look at me as your father. You know, when you're older, you need to be responsible. You need to take care of your sisters. You need to take care of your wife. You know, you're the breadwinner. That is where the boy gets his teaching life teachings of manhood from but ultimately he has to understand that his mother comes first for for a boy like if i cannot leave my mother alone and that's from the age of seven that's instilled in young boys from the age of, so that they have that respect for women you don't abandon your mothers you don't abandon you know your sisters if you're the only mahram you stay with your mother so going on to the story i have a client he's in his early 40s now I do get clients who are narcissists. Um, they do come to me and, you know, they, they need help, you know, for their narcissism. Now, just before I go on to his story, I do want to say that there is hope for narcissists to change, but it has to come from within themselves. I will, I could talk about this more later, but it's not impossible for a narcissist to actually want to change and can change. So I got this client coming to me and he's in his early 40s. He came to me because... He said to me, I woke up one day and I realized that I have destroyed absolutely everything in my life. And the realization hit me that it was in my hands, like everything I had destroyed in my life. Three marriages, you know, he's got children from these marriages. He's destroyed his relationship with his parents, with his friends, with everybody he knows, with his business partner. And he wanted to know what was wrong with him. He said, you know, and one day someone told him that you are the common factor in all of this so the problem must be you so um so someone told him look i went to this um therapist and she managed to help me why don't you give her why don't you give it a go so he came to me it did take it did take a few sessions to get to the bottom of his um, issues but basically his issues were he could not stop using women in a bad way since he was the age of 13 so from the age of 13, you know, he would have girlfriends in school, he'd break their hearts, he would be mean to them, horrible to them. It was a game for him. He would really enjoy, he was a very, he was a very good looking man and he used that to his advantage. He saw 
that he could actually have that power that he wanted with other people just because he had, you know, because he was handsome. So he went from girlfriend to girlfriend, girlfriend to girlfriend, breaking hearts and playing the love bombing, you know, game, which is pretending to be everything you've ever wanted. That's what a narcissist does. They come to you with so much romance, so many compliments, so much validation. You will feel your absolute best as a human being and as a woman and as a man during the love bombing phase. You will feel like you no one's better than you. You are queen, you are king. And they make you feel like that. And then one day, unexpectedly, they will pull that rug from underneath your feet and you will come crashing down, heartbreak after heartbreak, and so on. So he went through his life. He got married. You know, he he got divorced. Again, same way. Love bombed her. She was a trophy wife. He had a son from her. She had enough. She ended up getting a divorce. And then he just, basically, this was his life. When I sat with him, I said to him, look, you know, what is this hate that you have for women? We had to do a lot of digging to actually get back to this story because we're talking over 30 years of, you know, trauma. When he was uh, about seven or eight, his father went away on business and he was very close to his mother. His mother was his whole world. His, he said, however, he said that one day he came home. He was playing football with his friends. He came home and um, he actually found his mother in the bedroom with another man while his father was away on you know, for work. And every dream that he had about his mother, it just shattered because, you know, at the end of the day, all a child wants is for their mum and dad to live in the same house and for a mum and dad to be happy. You know, that's all you want. That's all a child wants to see their, their parents happy because it gives them that feeling of safety. Now, when they see a parent do something so wrong like that, it makes them question their reality. And it also makes them lose trust in that person. So he said, when I saw that, made me question everything I knew about my mother. Are all women like this? She pretends that she loves my father, but in reality, this is what she's doing behind his back. And I just so happened to see it happen at that time. From that day, he decided all women are evil. No woman can be trusted. After that, he said, no matter what a woman did for me, no matter how nice she was to me, no matter how much she cared for me, you know, she would honour me when, I, when, I'm, when I'm not present with her, when I'm out of the house. I could trust her if I left the house. And it wasn't until his early 40s did he realise why he did all of that. He didn't know it was because of that, that one incident that happened when he was seven or eight. Like he didn't do it with that conscious, um, with, with that memory in mind every time. So every time he got married, it wasn't, you know, with, with that in mind. It really, he really broke down. He cried a lot when he remembered that, when he came to the realisation that all of his problems were because of that one incident. Thank you for sharing that story with us. The story really changed the way that I viewed narcissism and those who are narcissistic because, you know, if you meet someone who doesn't have good characteristics, who you know, essentially destroys the good people in their life, you would think, you know, this, this person is so awful, this person is horrible. But when you know the reason why they are the way they are, even though it doesn't excuse their behavior, it just allows you to look at the issue in a different light. And it gives you a deeper understanding on why that person is the way that they are. So thank you for sharing that with us. This is why it's haram to judge other people. You see the outset. You see the outside of, you know, of someone's character. You see how they behave in society. They see, you see how they behave with you. And people are quick to judge. Oh, that person's so evil. That person is a sinner. That person's a liar. That person, you know, has this disorder or that disorder. You don't actually know their story and why they became like that. And that is why the only, the only who can judge us is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because only he knows. Only he knows. Because at the end of the day, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that we are all brothers and sisters in this and we all have to help each other. Not everyone has the blessing of having a wonderful father, a wonderful mother, you know, a healthy upbringing. I think people have to be more compassionate towards men and women who didn't give that, who didn't get that loving upbringing, you know, as, as children. You have, people have to understand that that will really affect you as an adult. 
if someone was going through an s- experience where they're with someone who is a narcissist, either their partner or a parent or someone really close to them, how do you think that person can help n- the narcissist change? How do you think a person can help a narcissist seek help? Now, in regards to a narcissist, um, it's very difficult to get a narcissist to change depending on where they are in their level of narcissism. So there are different levels of narcissism. Okay. Now, the extreme end of the scale for a narcissist would be the psychopath. The psychopath who has no remorse for anything, the murderer, you know, the, the people who do really psycho things that, you know, they, they go to jail for life for. And then the lower end of the scale, the, you know, the, the minor the amateur narcissist will be someone, for example, who's a player. He might be a young man, 19, 20 years old. He'll be a player, plays around with women, but he still feels a bit, you know, rubbish about himself for doing that. But it doesn't stop him from doing it because women still tolerate him. Women still entertain him for being handsome. They allow him to, you know, treat them that way. So a narcissist finds it very difficult to get the help that they need because in their minds, they're never wrong. And why are they never wrong? It's because they put the blame on you. They say, well, you know you're being abused by me. Why are you accepting it? If you didn't want to accept it, you can walk away. So a narcissist never feels like they are the ones who need therapy because if you're the one who's tolerating it, you're the one who needs therapy. Do you see what I mean? So it's like, this is the way I am. And you're the one who's deciding to put up with me. You're the one with the problem, not me. So they don't see the need for therapy. They see that everyone else needs therapy. All their victims need therapy because victims are tolerating and accepting, you know, what they shouldn't really be accepting. So they see everyone else as being people who, you know, need the help. Now, when does a narcissist seek help? They will pretend to seek help if they want to hold on to a marriage. So, for example, if a, if a very, a very good source of supply wife who does everything for him, is fed up with him and wants to get out of the marriage. Um, And she gives him the ultimatum of, you know, we have to go for marriage counselling or, you know, I'm done. I'm going to go and get a khula. Um, He will be like, fine, we'll do the marriage counselling. He doesn't do it with the intention to change anything, but just so he could show the world that, look, I'm, you know, I'm doing what is needed to save this marriage. So you can never, ever, ever change a narcissist. No matter what you do, a narcissist will never change because of you. I had a client as well who, this is another story, deceived people in business. He's always treated women horribly. He said to me that the reason why he came to therapy is because he wasn't able to deal with his depression from losing a three-year-old son. Now, this was the only the only thing he had in his life that he felt he loved. So, Just before I continue the rest of this story, I just want to say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives everyone a portion of empathy. Anyone who tells you, any psychologist who tells you that narcissists are 100% void of empathy are wrong. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala leaves a portion of empathy in every single person from, you know, from the the minor sinner to the major sinner, to the tyrant, the oppressor, the fir'aun of our time. He leaves them with a portion of empathy because... If he didn't leave them with a portion of empathy, then there's no way back to him. There's no way back for repentance. So if you wake up every morning, you know, that's another chance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for you to repent, no matter who you are, narcissist or not narcissist. So you will find that a narcissist always has a weak point. They always have something in their life that they're very drawn to, attached to, that they sincerely love. And it could be a pet. It could be a pet dog. It could be a cat. It could be anything it could be a best friend or a narcissistic uncle that they look up to um it could be anything so so going back to this story again this guy was in his uh, mid-40s this was his first child his father had become everything to him this you know that the it become you know he had become his world so the narcissist this particular narcissist knows that everyone hates him everyone thinks badly of him everyone knows who he is, because as as the narcissist gets older, their game gets weaker and they're more exposed and they easily give themselves away because they lose their, 
they lose their mojo, you know, they lose they lose the game, they lose their wit and their intelligence to, you know, keep it going, they get tired. So this particular man, he always wanted children and um Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him one child. So with children, you know, children tend to idolize their fathers, you know, especially if the father's fun, you know, he takes them out, you know, takes them out for food and chips and and all that kind of stuff. So he grew very attached to this child. Now, during this period of him being very attached to this little boy, he was still wronging other people. He was still doing wrong to his wife. He was having affairs behind her back. He was doing all sorts of things. And subhanAllah, one day, the child must have been about three and a half. Um, he got involved in a car accident and the child died. Now, that particular incident, what it did to that narcissist was it completely crumbled his life. Completely, because this child was the only thing, the only being in his life that was worth living for. And many narcissists in this situation may even commit suicide as well. A lot of narcissists do commit suicide because they have no idea how to deal with their emotions. All their life they have been trained to not have any emotions, not show empathy, not show depression. So it takes a very traumatic event like that to make a narcissist want to change. You know, these traumas come to us to humble us. If you are in a, a narcissistic relationship, um, stop thinking that you're going to change that narcissist. You'll never change that narcissist. They'll always pretend to change, but it doesn't last very long. It will never happen. But there's hope for, it, for, for them to change. There's always hope. I really like the way you end your book on how to heal from trauma. And your story is so inspiring on its own because you had a narcissistic partner in your marriage, but you used you got out and you used that experience to now help others who are going through similar experiences. Can you tell us a bit more about where someone can start with healing? There's always hope for healing. I always tell I always tell my clients this, I tell everyone I speak to this. If you, and you had an experience with a narcissist, it's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to teach you something via that person. The narcissist came into your life to teach you something about yourself. And when I say that, I mean it in the sense that it's like soldier training, where you identify your weaknesses, identify where you have no boundaries, and work on that. Now, a lot of people, when they come out of narcissistic abuse and narcissistic marriages, they beat themselves up over what they've been through. You know, you get a lot of people coming and they're finding it very difficult to heal and move on because they can't believe they allowed themselves to be treated that way. They can't believe they fell for the narcissist, you know, deception. They can't believe that they were abused and abused for so long and did nothing about it, didn't have the courage to get a divorce, didn't have the courage to get help. Um, so many people come out of it and they really delay their healing journey by not understanding that this was a lesson. So you can start the healing journey on a positive note, which is what did I take from this? Okay, every, what happened happened. There's nothing I can do about it now. What, is, what am I going to do it about it from today? What did I learn? What, how, what am I going to fix in myself to never go through that again? Right? And then you get other people who go into depression go into complete depression. Why did the narcissist leave me? I loved the narcissist. I did everything for the narcissist. I gave them all my money. I had their children. I did this. I did that. How could they treat me that way? I was such a good wife. I was such a good husband. Treat yourself like after the abuse because what's going to happen after coming out of, an or out of an abusive relationship and they ask themselves, why did I put myself through that? Why did he not love me? Why did she not love me? I was the best wife, best husband. They go and they go and look for another narcissist to prove their worth. They go from one narcissistic relationship to the next because they haven't learned the lesson. Now they're like, I'm adamant to prove to the world that I am a good wife, that I will not be discarded again. So they fall into the arms of someone who is like them and worse. So the healing journey in my book starts with the lessons that you've learned. You know the blessings that you've got from this, from this um, relationship, because Allah Subhanahu wa Taala tells us in the matter of with hardship I will give you ease. I will give you beautiful children out of it. Go and find help. Go and find out why you're codependent. You know He wants you to learn about yourself. So, you know you get a lot of people. They say, but I got married. I wanted it to last forever. Not every marriage will last forever. Who who told you every marriage will last forever? 
Allah, it's it's in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hands how long our marriages will last. Thank you so much for talking to us, Dr. Mona. I think it's so important to have a source such as yourself that examines the field of psychology through an Islamic worldview. Because as you mentioned, a Western psychologist might claim that a narcissist has no empathy, which isn't beneficial to either the narcissist or the victim. But Islam teaches us that everyone is born pure and can return to their fitra with the right help. So thank you so much for being here and for sharing your insight with us. So I really hope, inshallah, that you know people have benefited from this podcast and, ben- and will benefit from the book if they haven't read it yet. And I do thank- offer one-to-one counseling and coaching for anyone who needs it. So, um, so yeah, I hope, inshallah, that's that's a bit of uh, benefit to everybody. For sure, it's 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 been great having you here. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Jazakumallah khair. Alaikum. Alaikum If you would like to contact us, please email muslimmindsetpodcast at gmail.com. Until next time, thanks for listening.